Welcome to City Church's On Demand Messages. My name is Josh, and we're so glad you're tuning in whenever and wherever you're tuning in from. In fact, if it's your first time, we'd love to connect with you. You can text new to the number on the screen right now. We've got a free gift for you. Also, if you need prayer, we would love to pray with you. We believe that prayer is not our last resort, but it is our first response to what is going on in our lives and the lives of those around us. And so we'd love to join in with you. And so you can text next to the number on the screen. Also, if you'd like to invest financially into the mission of City Church to be a Jesus movement that awakens the soul in the city, um, you can text next as well to the number on the screen. We believe every Sunday morning when we gather in person and online, and we open up God's word that he has something special and specific for every one of us. And so as we lean into this week's message um, that you're about to watch, we pray that God open up, opens up your heart to whatever, um, whatever he has for you. And we hope that you are encouraged by today's message. Again, if we can do anything for you, please let us know. Exciting, right? Yeah. Super pumped. Okay. Um, so we're starting a new series this morning called More. Can you say it with me? More. Say it one more time. More. We believe this. God is a God of more. Like, I believe this with my whole heart. God doesn't want to do less in your life this week. God wants to do more. God doesn't want to do less in your marriage, less in your relationships, less in your friendships. He wants to do more. God doesn't want to do less in, uh, in your neighborhood. He doesn't want to do less in your workplace. He wants to do more. God doesn't want to do less in our church and in our city. God wants to do more. Now, the good news is that we know how to make room for more in our lives, right? Case in point, the minivan. When you got family or you got a lot of stuff in your hall, like, guess what? You subscribe to the minivan life. Anybody subscribe to the minivan life? You're in it? You're there. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Right? We know how to make more. And, and this one's going to frustrate some of you because you've experienced it before. We know how to make more when we've seen this message on our phone. There's not enough space available to take this photo. So I've got to either delete stuff or make room for more in that space. We know how to make room for more. God is a God of more. In fact, Ephesians 3.20 says this. It says that now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, him is God, able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. So God can do more. God wants to do more. But the thing I think that we rarely ask is, what is the more on the mind of God? Because we just say, okay, I think I know what the more is. I, th I think I know what God wants to do in my life. I think I know, yeah, I get it, the more. Like, he wants to give me more favor. God wants to do more of this in my life. But do we ever stop and ask, what does he actually want more of in my life? What is the more on the mind of God? And so to answer this question, we're going to be in this book of the Bible. It's an Old Testament. It's a book called Jonah in the Bible. So go ahead and turn there. In fact, today, we're only going to be in the book of Jonah, the first chapter. For the next five weeks, we're going to be in the book of Jonah asking this question, what is the more on the mind of God? So if you've ever heard of the book of Jonah, you know um, that it's about a man and a fish, yeah. right? It's about a man and a whale. In fact, I did, I did a Google search of like children's books, and almost every single children's book had the man and the whale on the book. But the problem is in the book of Jonah, the whale only gets two verses, like two sentences, we talk about it, yet we associate it with them. Jonah is not a book about a magical fish. It's not even, about, it's not even a book about a man. It's a book about God inviting a man to be as close as he possibly can to him and what that man decided to do. It's a book about God wanting more for our lives and his life and him deciding what he wanted to do with it. So whenever we start a book study and we kind of walk through a book, um, as we're going to do in this, we usually, I usually like to go to a place on YouTube. It's called The Bible Project. The Bible Project just kind of gives the book of the Bible in a snapshot and visually. And what I've learned is what, that there are parts of The Bible Project and what they can do visually and, and audibly in two minutes is more than I could do in 10 minutes. And so this morning, what we're going to do is I want to actually introduce you to the first few um, things about the book of Jonah by showing you the Bible project. And so it's going to kind of set us up. It's going to kind of introduce who he is, who Jonah is, and what this book is actually about. And then I'm going to come up after this video, and we're going to dive straight into Jonah chapter 1. Are you ready? Yep. Awesome. All right. Check this out. The book of Jonah, a subversive story about a rebellious prophet who hates God for loving his enemies. Jonah's unique among the prophets of the Old Testament because they're typically collections of God's words spoken through the prophet. But this book doesn't actually focus on the words of the prophet. Rather, it's a story about a prophet. 
a really mean and nasty prophet. Jonah appears only one other time in the Old Testament. It's during the reign of Jeroboam II, one of Israel's worst kings. And Jonah prophesied in his favor, promising that he would win a battle and regain all this territory on Israel's northern border. Now, it's important to know that the prophet Amos also confronted Jeroboam, and through him, God specifically reversed Jonah's prophecy, promising that Jeroboam would lose all of those same territories because he was so horrible. So before the story of Jonah even begins, we are suspicious of Jonah's character. The book of Jonah has a beautiful design with all this literary pairing and symmetry. So you have chapters 1 and 3 telling the story of Jonah's encounter with non-Israelites, first with some sailors and then with Jonah's hated enemies, the Ninevites. And each part offers a comic contrast between Jonah's selfishness and the pagans' humility and repentance. Chapters 2 and 4 contain prayers of Jonah. One is a prayer of repentance, kind of, and the other is a prayer in which Jonah chews out God for being too nice. Now, this careful design of the book is matched by a really unique style of narration. The story is full of all of these stereotyped characters who, ironically, do the exact opposite of what you think they would do. So you have the prophet, the man of God, who rebels and hates his own God. You have the sailors who are supposed to be really immoral, but actually they have soft, repentant hearts and turn to God in humility. You have the king of the most powerful, murderous empire on the planet, and he humbles himself before God because of Jonah's five-word sermon, and even the king's cows repent. This kind of story fits what today we would call satire. These are stories about well-known figures who are placed in extreme circumstances, and they use humor and irony to critique their stupidity and character flaws. So there's a little bit about this book of Jonah, much more than just a book about a big fish. So let's jump right in. Jonah chapter 1 verse 1 says this, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So the first thing we see is God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh, go to this place. Now a little bit about Nineveh, it was a great city. And so it said that it was so great architecturally that the walls of the city, you could drive three chariots down the middle of it. Also, we see that the greatest culture and artists come from this city. It's a great city. But it's also a wicked city. And in fact, Nona was known, or Nineveh, Nona, <laughs> there we go. Nineveh was known as some of the cruelest people in the ancient world. When they would conquer another city, they would skin alive a lot of the men and women and children and spread out their skins over the city walls. They would also do this. They would actually cut off their legs and one of their arms so that the, that the, the enemies, that the Ninevites, could actually shake the hand that was left as that person died. I mean, this was who Nineveh was, and yet, as Tim Keller says, they, Nineveh was the object of God's affection, his love, his mission, and his mercy. But if you know this about Nineveh, and also what, you, what we see in the Old Testament is that Nineveh was a direct um, kind of bully to Israel, and so Jonah more than likely had experienced Nineveh's cruelty. So when you get this, when you understand who Nineveh was and what God was sending Jonah to do and why he was sending him to do it, you, would, you understand why verse 3 happens. Verse 3, Jonah rose to flee or to run to Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship ready or a ship going to Tarshish. We'll come back to that ship. It's very important. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord, away from the presence of the Lord. And this begins the calling of Jonah that turns into the rebellion of Jonah. See, Jonah didn't just go a little ways away. He went a long ways away. Here's a map of where God was calling Jonah to be. So here is Jonah and where he started. And then he went down to Joppa, and Nineveh was right here, like about 500 miles. And then Tarshish is all the way over here. It's about 2,500 miles. And so what Jonah said was, no, 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 I'm not going to go to Nineveh. I'm not going to go here. And we'll get to why he was like that and felt that way later. But what he said is, I'm going to go all the way over to Tarshish. He decided to say no to God. This is what rebellion is. Rebellion seems like the strong word, but it's simply saying no to God. In a little while, we're going to have baptisms. And within that baptism, we say, we, we, we repeat what Peter talked about, and he said about Jesus, that Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. It's one thing to know that Jesus saves us. It's another thing to give him total control of our life, and that's what Lord means. And, and what happened is I fully believe and aware that, that Jonah knew God as a saving God, but he didn't want to know God as his Lord because he made the decision to say no. He rebelled against God. 
I think there are a lot of godly people who look at, and they look like they're walking with God, but there's one area of their life where they, they just say no to him. Maybe it's a sin that you need to confess. Maybe it's a sacrifice of your time that he's leading you to make. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it is. It's, it's serving in a space. It's serving um, at church. It's serving in the community. Maybe it's serving in, in kids. And you're like, I think God's calling me to serve in kids right now, but I just don't know. I just don't know. And so we say, if I don't know, I just tell him no. Whatever that is, maybe it's time. Maybe it's a relationship that you know is not pleasing to God, but you just won't quit. Maybe there's a sacrifice that God has put on your heart to make. Maybe it's money. It's a financial sacrifice that God has placed a need on your heart to give, but you just won't give up the money. Or he's convicted you about your lifestyle, and you know you shouldn't be indulging yourself the way you are, but you keep on going. We can be like Jonah. And on the outside, show up on a Sunday and look like we love God with all of our hearts, but we say, God, there's one thing I'm not going to give you. Surrender is a surrender, and Jesus is in Lord until he has lordship over everything. And we don't get to experience him in that way until we give him everything. And Jonah said, nope. The second thing is Jonah found a ship in Joppa that was ready to go to Tarshish. He found a ready ship. So he found this ship that was going to Tarshish. Like This was a ship that was ready to go. Sometimes I think we assume that the readiness of the ship is like God's okay for the plan of action. Like I wonder if Jonah got to that place, and we can go back to the map real fast, I'm sorry. I wonder if Jonah got to this place and he's like, well, the ship seems to be ready. I'll pay my fare, I'll hop on it, I'll just go. And we think the ease or the readiness of the ship means that this is God's plan, but sometimes it's not. Like sometimes I have conversations with people and they're like, man, I, I don't think this is, a, uh, this is, this is uh, going towards the will of God. I think this is maybe against the will of God or maybe they don't, they don't even know it, but they just say, look, it just all worked out. Well, I was miserable in my marriage and, and, and not because of there was if, anything like that. It's just like we just didn't seem to love each other anymore. And so this other person came along and I just felt like God was saying, well, now I just want you to be happy. So I just went through with a divorce because I just wanted to be happy with somebody else. So that was a ready ship. That was, that was Tarshish. Or, or maybe, maybe for us, it, it wasn't that. It was, it was something else that it was just like, well, I know I shouldn't cheat in this. I know I shouldn't lie in this, but it just seems so easy. It just seems so easy. But what if, what if that wasn't God's will for you, but it was actually the enemy laying a trap for you? Because if you want to run from God, there will always be a ready ship. Like if you want to get away from God, if you want to disobey God, guess what? There will always be a ready ship to Tarshish, whatever that is. There will always be one. You have an enemy whose whole role is to ready the ship for your disobedience. Like when it says in John that the enemy prowls around like a lion, seeing who can kill and destroy. He, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. And this is what he does. He's like, how can I put a ship in their lives that just seems ready to take them in the opposite direction of where God wants them to go? If you always allow your eyes to wander, there will always be a girl or a guy who will return your flirtations. If you want it out of your marriage, there will always be a too-good-to-be-true relationship that presents itself. If you continue to accept greed in your life, there will always be a great deal on something to buy or a way to cheat or a way to steal to go ahead. One of Satan's primary roles is to give us a false peace about doing the wrong thing. And the peace in your heart may not be God's affirmation of what you're doing. It may be Satan numbing your conscience as he leads you down a path towards death. And I think the question is, well, then how do I know? How do I know if it's God calling me or how do, I, how do I not? I would say this, that if the peace in your heart does not line up with God's word, it isn't peace. If the peace in your heart isn't, doesn't line up with God's word, it isn't peace. It's, it's a false peace. It's a false peace. And, and, and I, I, this is, I, told you, I told you it wasn't going to be easy today. But, but, but I just know this. Like this, this book, God gave it to us to show so it shows how much God loves us. I mean, we'll get to how much he loved the Nineveh <laughs> later. But, but how much he loved Jonah to say, Jonah, I have this call and I'm placing this on your life. And, and what Jonah did was he decided to give up God's call in his life and he decided to run from God. And I imagine for a little while he felt like it may have been the right thing. Well, maybe I didn't hear exactly right. But I will tell you this. If you're in something, you're like, I don't know if I should do this, if I shouldn't. But is it wrong or is it right? I would tell you two things. The first thing is this. God gives us his presence to lead us in a direction towards him. But he also gives us his word. And I think sometimes we leave out his word. And, say, and so we say, we say something like, you know what? Like, it just it, you know, it felt right. Or like, I think this was God saying that. And we never actually take the time to dig into his word. I think that's also why God gives us his church. To, to ask people. 
to reach out so that we don't have that. Because what the enemy's doing, he's saying, hey, if I could just plant this false sense of peace in your life to make you think that this is right, I can lead you down a path all the way to Tarshish. And even, and by the time you figure out, I mean, it, I, spoiler alert, but if you would have gotten to Tarshish or whatever, like, by the time you figure that out, you're too far away at that point. Like, and, and I think that's the thing that we, we, we have to understand is that we can't, like, love God and say that we love him with all of our hearts and say no to God and think that we're still growing closer to God. Because there's something in our heart that's, there's something in our life that's, that's keeping us from doing that. If you want to run from God, there will always be a ready ship. So instead of running with God, Jonah runs from God. The result, verse 4, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and he lay down, and he'd fallen fast asleep. So Jonah's disobedience doesn't just affect him. It affects others. And, and our no to God affects other people in our life as well. Like, we never sin in private. For some, our family and our friends are suffering because of our disobedience. So I can't, we can't be the fathers or the mothers that we're called to be because of our disobedience. And so our kids are suffering for it. Our marriages are suffering. Our friendships and our cohorts, it's, it's suffering because of our disobedience. Because something in our life is not drawing us closer to God. The greatest gift that you can give to everyone who knows you, to a spouse, to your kids, to your coworkers, to your neighbors, and even your enemies, is our obedience to God. I think about these bricks. All these bricks are the names of people that, that are represented in our church that have friends um, or family or someone in their life that they know that don't know Jesus. Like there's 342 names on these bricks of people that don't know Jesus or don't go to church somewhere. These people are either being affected in a positive way because of our obedience or in a negative way because of our disobedience. And, and we want so badly for them to meet Jesus, but I think we have to ask the question, am I continually meeting Jesus? Am I continually showing them Jesus? Because our sin doesn't just affect us, it affects those around us. And so the men are in the ship and they're freaking out saying, what's going on? They don't have an idea or a clue of what's going on. So God sends this storm to break Jonah of his stubbornness, but he also sends it to break him of his self-reliance. And so what continues to happen is the men are like, what's happening? What's happening? They say prayers to the God and eventually the captain goes down to Jonah. He's like, what are you doing sleeping? So Jonah comes up and they cast lots to figure out who's the person that has caused this and guess where the lot falls? <laughs> Jonah. And so he says, that I'm a servant of the Most High God. I'm a prophet of God. All these things. Like, well, what are you doing on this ship? Verse 11. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you <laughs> that the sea may quiet down for us, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. T -t 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 yep, that word. <laughs> he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you because I know it is because because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now, is Jonah fully there yet? No, he's not there. But at least Jonah actually owns that this thing is because of me. He takes responsibility for his disobedience and takes his first step towards that responsibility. So verse 14, therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not, uh, lay not on us the innocent blood for you. O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Now get this, because his sin affected, his disobedience affected the people in the ship. But look what his obedience does. At this time, the men who were worshiping pagan gods greatly feared the Lord. They offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. That's why you talk, we look at this story and we see these guys that shouldn't have anything to do with God that are worshiping other gods. And then all of a sudden they see God's power and they, they give sacrifices to the one true God. They actually say, God, we, we fear you. We honor you. We, we respect you. If Jonah had continued to fight the storm, it probably would have killed him and everyone on board. But he submitted and he said, throw me into it. And it led to his salvation and to their salvation. You see, we ask the question, what is the more on the mind of God? Because we can say, oh, God wants more from me. God wants more from me. But what does that actually mean? I, I think when we look at Jonah 1, the more on the mind of God is surrender. The more on the mind of God is surrender. What was God asked Jonah to do from the very beginning? Hey, would you just go? Would you go? And Jonah said, no. And so what, what, is, the, what is the more on the mind of God? There are so many, but what we see in this first one is simply surrender. 
believe with all my heart that the storm was God's strategy to wake up Jonah to a place of surrender. And in a posture of surrender, he raised his hand and owned his disobedience. And I think, in fact, I know that at some point, we will all receive a Nineveh kind of call. Where God says, I want you to do this, I want you to go here, I want you to be this. And that word will at first, in the same way that Jonah felt it, it will make no sense at all. So, so if God says, I want you to say sorry to them, admit that you were wrong, I want you to give that gift, I want you to serve on that team, I want you to, to befriend that neighbor, I want you to pray for them, I want you to fast from that. God's going to give us those kind of things, and in fact, right now, I, I believe that maybe some of us are in the seat of Jonah, and God's already told you something, and you're just avoiding it. You're on your way to Tarshish right now. The question is, when God gives you that word, will you sleep through it, or will you surrender to it? When God gives you the call, when God places the word on your life, when God says, go here, do this, be this, whatever it is, give this up, let this sin go, will you just sleep through it like Jonah was trying to do, or will you surrender to it? Because the more on his mind for you and for me is surrender, but the more begins with you. It begins with you saying, God, I give you everything and everyone. It's just another way of saying, God, I surrender. I give up my way. I give up my plans. I give up what I want to do. And God, I ask the question, what do you want me to do? God, I give up the things in my life right now that I know don't please you and don't honor you. And God, I give it to you. I think at times we jump like four steps ahead. And so probably maybe what you're thinking right now is if I, if I own up to my disobedience, if I ad- admit and surrender to God, if I do this right now, what's going to happen in a month from now, two months from now, five months from now, a year from now? Well, here's what I love. <laughs> Verse one, God says, Jonah, go. He doesn't give him the sermon. He doesn't give him the message. He doesn't give him the way. He just says, Go. And I think we get so caught up in the fifth and sixth step of what this could look like and what am I going to do that we never get to the first step. And I think the enemy's loving it because he's like, if I could just get you locked up in analysis paralysis, you'll never do anything for Jesus. But when God says go, then we just go. And we trust him that he will give us the word for the next day and the next day and the next moment and the next step. We may not know what to say, but God will at least give us the, the movement and the conviction to actually surrender. So what is your net of a call? What has God called you to? What is he asking you to do? What is he asking you to be? What is he asking you to give up? Don't run from it. Surrender to it and receive his grace and his mercy because he's waiting for us and walk in him. This morning, um, in a few minutes, uh, I'm going to pray for us and I'm going to walk us through what we did in the beginning of this before my message as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to have some of our leadership in the back of the room for prayer. I didn't tell them this beforehand, and so um, if you're leadership, I need you in the back of the room for prayer, okay? So our staff will be back there to pray. Because I think there are times when the surrender is hard and the surrender feels overwhelming and you need somebody else to kind of come alongside you and say, I've got you, God loves you, and he's got a plan for your life. How can I help you take this step? So as we do that, and then as we step into communion, I'll explain that in a second. If you need prayer for anything, step into that. So this time, everyone, I'd ask everyone just to kind of bow your head and close your eyes. And if you were honest this morning, let's say, there is something in my life that God is calling me to that I just need to surrender to his will. He's given me a net of a word. He's given me a net of a call. And I'm running from it. And I just need prayer because I know I'm supposed to surrender to it. I don't know what that is, and I don't have to know. God knows, and he's putting that on your heart right now. But if that's you, every eye's closed. No one's looking. No one's judging or anything like that. But if you just be honest, and your first response in this is just raising your hand and saying, that's me. I know I need to surrender to something. I know God's calling me to surrender to something. I just need to do it. I just need to do it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You Put your hands down. I want to invite us into what I invited us into 25 minutes ago. To say these words to ourselves, but maybe for the first time, we don't just say them in our minds, but we say them in our hearts. 
And we just simply say, just in the stillness of this moment, just quietly, God, I give you everything and everyone. God, I thank you that you are a God of second chances. You are a God that forgives. You're a God that reinstates. So God, right now, I just pray for the person who's beating themselves up because they've been running. God, we believe that that shame is not from you. God, we believe the guilt that we're hurling on ourselves is not from you, but we do believe that that conviction is from you. And so, God, we receive that. We ask for forgiveness. And God, your word says that when we ask, we receive it. We confess our sins. You are faithful and just to forgive. And so, God, right now, would just forgiveness flow all through this room. Let me pray. Amen.